All right, thanks for your patience, everybody. So um, we're going to get started. If you could uh, grab a seat. And uh, we're going to get started with Leon Lincoln, who's going to talk about iOS and the enterprise. So good morning, everyone. So I, let me introduce myself. As you heard, my name is Leon. Uh, I am a, currently I am a design solutions engineer at VF Corp. And what's VF Corp? It's like nobody's ever heard of it, and nor should you have. So VF Corp is the parent company that owns North Face, Timberland, Vans, Wrangler, Lee, and about 22 other different brands. So my job consists of supporting the designers and brand creators across the globe. So it's kind of an interesting job where I get to look at solutions all the time, and I'm always trying to push the envelope for what we can make my users' jobs easier and easier. One of the biggest complaints we get about is, you know, they need powerful systems at their desks, but when they go out to meetings and so on, they, they don't want to carry their laptops. You know, and it's like, you look at it and go, really, how heavy is a laptop, right? But in their world, you know, having something that's extremely portable, such as this, really makes a huge difference for them. Because they're not trying to do their design work on this per se, they do some, but they're really trying to do is follow up on their meetings, and when they go out to their manufacturing facilities in like China and Vietnam, they want to be able to view what they're manufacturing and make design notes if they need to. So. I sit there and I think about this process all the time. So my talk is really going to be about iOS and the enterprise and how to leverage those devices. Is it an appropriate solution for the end user? It's important to recognize it's not a perfect solution for everybody. But in a lot of cases, when you define what they really need, we're going to say, yeah, it actually is a good solution, and we're going to break that all down for you. But I want to. So we're going to talk about devices. We're going to talk about business applications. You know, what software is really available for them? We're going to look at storage. We're going to look at security. We're going to look at support. Because it's a new model if you're trying to deal with iOS devices as in a large fleet or even a small user group. So, but I want to give you kind of a little bit of a history. So I've been doing this job for, in the, working in the IT industry for a long time. My first portable device was that. That's an IBM PC portable. Thing weighed about 39 pounds. So I have very little sympathy when somebody says, my laptop's too heavy. It's like, you have no idea what I used to have to lug around. Right? And that was a workhorse for me. And that same year, I got that. And it blew my mind. Anybody know what that is? It's from a company that doesn't exist anymore. Right? It's a little Radio Shack Model 100 computer. What really changed the world for me with that was it, was it ran on AA batteries. It had a built-in modem. It was huge. Because I could now then you know, go into my mini and mainframes and connect to them when I was on a site and actually make changes to this, those machines. Right? My first Mac Portable, that's what it looked like. No, that's not the first Mac Portable that ever came out but that's the first one that was usable for me, right? This was my workhorse for many, many years. How many people remember this machine, right? Yeah, it was a great machine. I loved the fact that it had drive bays, that you could either put two batteries in if you really needed a long life, or you needed flexibility, like, you know what, I need that DVD drive, or no, I need that zip drive, right? It's like, yeah, I need that quick, you know, pop that sucker in and it was good to go. It, you know, I. Again, it, it was my favorite machine. I carried that thing until the point where I was like, I just couldn't do the work I needed anymore. And then I went to that. And I learned to hate it. Does everybody remember the titanium? It's supposed to be super strong. Yeah, titanium might be, but it wasn't on the laptop. It was so soft, it was pathetic. Right? And then, when, then they went to the aluminum casing. I was like, oh, that was better. I got some more rigidity, but it, it didn't scuff up as much. But, you know, this is really where my current work device for a laptop is. It's not a favorite anymore. You know, it's like, it's a decent machine. I'm not a big fan of the touch bar, right? I think it's more of a gimmick at this point. But it, it does have functions. 
but I live on this device, or I live on this device. It's not a book. It is my phone, right? So I really sat down. I was like, well, you know, in my world, what could I give people for devices? What do they really need? So I looked at it, and I said, all right, so iPhone versus iPad. What do they really need? Now, we do issue our company iPhones to people who travel a lot, and I'm like, okay, do they really need another device, or can they actually get away with just the one device from the company? Okay. So let's look at what we're talking about here. So you can see the size of the phone really, it's blurry, okay. So the size of the phone has actually gotten pretty interesting. So you know, when cell phones first came out, you know, they were really big and clunky, then the, the, the run was to go to a, a small, you know, the joke would be, how small could you get the phone, right? And we've kind of come the other direction where we're going, yeah, do you see my new iPhone? This was the joke, right? Well, this is where it's come to. It's actually quite substantial to when you look at it and go, I've got a pretty amazing size screen here, and I can do probably about 70% of what I need to do in communications from this device. I can keep up with my emails. I can keep up with my opening Word documents. Right? It's not comfortable for lots of work. But if I'm on the move and I just need to keep up with everything, this actually suffices. Because it has, if you look at it, I've got so many options when it comes to the network access. I've got network, I've got cellular, I've got Wi-Fi, I've got VPN on demand. These are critical things that I need to concern myself with. I've got a processor that's pretty amazing. It's is almost as powerful and it's more powerful than some ultra lap, light laptops. Right? We also look at it and we go, you know what, I get 10 hours of battery time. Now, that's certain functions. I will tell you that, you know, I had to go to Vans, which is in Costa Mesa, it's about 30 m miles from here on Monday and Tuesday. I don't live out in this area, so I'm like, okay, I know 405, but I need to make sure I know where I'm going. I put the GPS on. It took me an hour to get there with the GPS. I had two conference calls over an hour long each. At the end of three hours, I was charging this thing. Right? It's like, okay, but I had to make sure I had that stuff with me to make sure I could keep it charged. But for, if I'm not doing that kind of heavy, intense communications, right, it lasts all day for me. Right? Uh, the screen really matters. When you talk about having something that you can look at, and if I could sh get everybody to come up here and, and see what I'm looking at down here, you go, that's horrible, right? Because it's a little blurry, right? This is ultra fine. It's really easy on the eyes. The only problem we have sometimes is I can't quite read it. I get it's like I don't want to dig out my glasses. It's like the zoom in, all right? Uh, there is no pencil support f on this device currently. We keep wishing that they actually give us a stylus that's outside of this device. Right? Because, the, you know, that's Steve Jobs. It's like, the only stylus you ever need is right here. I'm like, no, this is great, but, it, you know, there's some things that Pencil does that are really exceptional. Now, compare that to, let's say, the, at the time I was writing these slides, that was the current generation of the iPad Pros. Okay? So you look at it and go, okay, so what do I have? I've got a device that's you know, 10 and a half to 12.9, almost 13 inches. That's pretty amazing. I can carry this device, and it's basically a 13-inch screen. I want you to really think about that. I can carry this all day long and have a full-fledged computer in my hand as opposed to carrying this laptop that I normally would have. All right? So I look at it, you know, there are keyboard options. So if you've ever tried typing on the built-in screen keyboard, it's limited, right? So those of you who are really adept at texting, it's like it's not a big deal. But for anybody who's used to really typing anything, it, you want a keyboard. Now, you know, the iPad Pro, you do get uh, a built-in cover keyboard, which is what I use here. But they also have Logitech makes a nice one also that some of our people love. Right? Again, you get network access, you get cellular options. Right? So if you buy an iPad with a cell, cell modem in it, you can actually plug it in, um, and it's, it's on the phone network. 
it can do everything you need. Um, if we look at it and say, okay, I can, you know, again, I get 10 hours of plus of battery life out of this thing. It's a different processor. It's the A10. It's not as powerful as the current iPhone, but it's actually very good, right? And you do get pencil support. And that was really important for us, for our designers, because they actually started using it as a drawing tablet. And, you know, they sit there and, they, you know, they were using it as opposed to, th you were using this device as opposed to a $3,000 Wacom. They were actually sitting down and going, okay, I can draw on this and do what I need. And it really moved the bar forward for them. While I was in the middle of writing these slides, this came out. I haven't got my hands on it yet. But the specs alone, when I watched the keynote, were like, you know what? This is really pushing the bar forward. The fact that I can go to a USB-C connection on the device now and actually drive a display at 4K, now I'm starting to think, really, okay, I can now actually say it's a viable alternative to a laptop. I get ultra portability and I get the ability to connect when I'm at my desk to a larger display and it works. All right, so we've looked at the we've looked at the devices and going right. So the iPad may be a real option, but that's only choosing the hardware. What about the software? Do we have the apps that I need to run on the device? So if we look and say, okay, so what are some of the critical things that we need to talk about? Well, you know, if your standard corporate environment or most businesses, you're in an Office 365 or Google Suite. All right, those are critical. You don't have that, you can't run anything. You can't run the business. You can't do day-to-day -day communications, right? But what about Adobe? What about AutoCAD? And I appreciate you can't really read this when you get too far back, so I'll just read them off to you. So, you know, AutoCAD is something we use for manufacturing, we, you know, but our HR apps, how do you manage those, you know, provide those solutions to the end users who are in the field? We look at, you know, supply chain management tools, customer relation tools, looking at specialty software, right? So there's an app that the business uses, but it doesn't exist as an iOS version. Does that mean I can't deploy this device? No, there are other solutions that I can do for that to get around that problem. And those things are such as Citrix and VMware. And then we'll sh look at it and say, what about Terminal? And we'll talk about that. All right, so Office 365. So when we look at it, so for many critical environments, you know, if you don't have the ability to have Word, Excel, PowerPoint, the business is just doesn't want to talk to you. Th th that's that critical for them. That's the foundation of everything they do. So the our iOS versions of those products are very good. Now, you know, there are some things that I would never say to somebody who works in Excel all day long going, yeah, I'm not going to deploy this to you as your primary device because setting the proper expectations. You want to make sure they understand that, you know, if they just need to look at, maybe look at an Excel spreadsheet once in a while or make a minor change in something, you know, that's fine. But if somebody who's really into finances and doing number crunching, they're not going to live on that device. Okay. Uh, you, part of the suite includes uh, OneNote. How many here have ever worked with OneNote? It's a great program. If you've never used it, I really encourage you to open it up. OneNote is a notebook program, and if it's really designed around how setting up chapters and pages. So I use it for a lot of project work because I can create a project that's a chapter, and then I can create pages that are subtasks under it, or pieces of that project that I need to work on. I can pull in reference files. I can literally store them inside the OneNote document, or I can have URLs. I can have to-do lists. I can have all these different things. It's really something that I encourage you to take a look at as a great solution, right? In OneDrive. How many people have actually worked with OneDrive, right? I, you know, I'm forced to live with OneDrive. It's our cloud solution, and we're going to talk about cloud storage and what it means to this platform. But when I first, like, okay, you want me to use OneDrive, and I kind of balked at it a little bit, but as I got to know it better and better, I can give Microsoft some credit. They work really hard at making it a better solution on a regular basis. 
And if you've not noticed, if you work with iOS versions of their tools on your iPads or iPhones, they update them very often. It's not the old company that was like, here, here's this th afterthought product. They actively work improving it at all times. Now, G Suite, uh, full disclosure, in my previous job, I was the Google administrator. I love Google for a lot of things. It works well. It's a great alternative to people who just don't want to deal with Microsoft. You know, being able to say I have a Gmail, that pretty amazing solution for businesses. Um, looking at and saying I can use docs, sheets, slides, right? I can read in Word files, as put them on in the Google. And if you're dealing with Google Drive, or G Drive as they call it now, uh, if you convert it from a Word file to a, to a docs, it doesn't count against your storage cap. That's huge. So, you know, as long as I keep everything native, it's like it's free space. Once I go outside of that, it starts counting. Right. Adobe, so again, I deal with a lot of creative people. So uh, Adobe Enterprise or Creative Cloud is a requirement that we have for everything that we put out. So it's amazing. So I look at it and say, all right, this Creative Cloud master app, as I call it, it exists on both my laptops and desktops. It also exists on the iPad. So w you know, it allows me to provide tools and access to the programs. So if the user wants to know how to do something, there's some how-tos that are actually built into that. So if they want to learn something they don't know already, they can go into that tool and say, OK, I can learn this new process. One of the exciting things that just came out of the, the latest Adobe conference was Photoshop being native on the iPad. Now, that's a big deal. Now, we did have Photoshop on the iPad already, but if you ever worked with it, it was always specific functions. So I'd have like three or four different versions of Photoshop and they were tied to doing specific things. So if I needed to fix something, I would open up the appropriate version of Photoshop on the iPad could do it and save it. Now I get full native capabil capabilities. I don't have to go worry about changing it. I can actually make and say it just worked with the one app. Now it doesn't have Illustrator yet. It has Adobe Draw. Adobe Draw is okay. It's not fantastic, right? So it's not meant. It's, so it's not quite there yet. But you know, you can see where it's going though. So if they get if they get Photoshop, how far behind is Illustrator? So they're, they're already thinking that this is the new main device. They're writing their code for it. Uh, Autodesk, again, uh, my job involves you know, working with 2D and 3D environments. So we use a lot of CAD programs. So you'd be surprised you know, when, I f when I first came into VF and I went, all right, what are we doing? I had to learn what it meant to make a shoe. I never realized how complex making a shoe was. It was pretty funny. It was like, really? That much engineering goes into this device? It's like, yep. So being able to look at those CAD drawings, so having the ability to look at DWG files and do minor edits on them from the iPad is huge because when they go to the manufacturing facility, they're all CAD at that point. So if they need to make an adjustment because they see something wrong in the manufacturing process, they can fix it from the iPad. They don't have to go back and say, all right, go back to the original 2D stuff, convert it, and move it forward again. They can do it right then and there. You know, we do use Sketchbook. Sketchbook is, a, again, from AutoCAD. It used to be a paid program. It's now free, um, which I like that. It's actually, you know, if you've never used it, um, get your creative pieces going. You know, actually play with it. It's actually a pretty interesting program. There's some gutches that we learned with uh, Sketchbook that I will talk about in some of the support issues. But Fusion 360 is actually the model, the 3D program we use to actually design footwear. Right? And BMI 360, if you're dealing with clients or your company deals with manufacturing structures, buildings, right? you're all AutoCAD, BMI 360 is actually the management tool that does, you can manage the site and do all that work. That exists on the iPad. So you can see it covers a lot of ground. So human resource apps, I'm not going to list them all that are out there, but the two that I work with on a regular basis are Workday and Kronos. So we use Workday as our corporate 
standard HR app, and we find that it's actually easier to use on the iPad than it is on the computers. And that really shocked me. It's like they spent more time developing for the iPad, right? Kronos is really geared towards our, you know, hourly staff, so it allows them to put their hours and everything. So a lot of times we have people that are working in the factories or the warehouses, and they have these devices or iPod, iPod touches, and they're able to run Kronos and they can do all their stuff, right? So we don't have to say, oh, there's a computer over in the corner there. They can actually, you know, pick up their computer, you know, their mobile device when they start their day, log in, do their work, log out, put it back in the dock, and pick it up the next day. It's all charged. All right? Supply chain, you know, I appreciate you can't really see too much of that right there, but there's 10 different companies that I found in a quick perusal for saying for supply chain management. So what is that really? So again, I come from a manufacturing background. We need to be able to track where our supplies are, where our product is that we're sending out to our retail chains or to our partners. You know, like Wrangler's number one partner is Walmart. You know, we have to be able to track what we send to them and how they distribute it. So we want to, you know, so we have the ability to do all that in the field with a supply chain management tool that lifts, lives on this. So for our sales force being able to do that, to quickly track and order, is a huge win for them. They're not only go, wait a minute, let me open up my laptop, let me go quickly, you know, go find that system. They can do it right from that device. Right? right? Customer relation manager. So if you use a CRM at all, and I encourage you, if you're really building a business, you're, this is a tool you want to get familiar with because it's going to help you build those relationships and track what you're doing with them. You make notes about your relationship with, and you can schedule tasks. It really is an important aspect of the business. So I do some outside consulting for my corporate work, right? I use tools like this to make sure, like, I haven't forgotten about my clients because I can get wrapped up in other things. So it kind of reminds me, like, hey, you haven't talked to this person in a while. Make sure you go out and schedule a time to visit them, right? Now, we did talk about, you know, when I went through the overview, Citrix and VMware. Right? How many people actually have ever used either one of those, Citrix or VMware? Right? These are great tools. Now, granted, you're going to look at those and say, well, that's a Windows environment. Yeah, it is, right? but they do run on the Mac. So this is a sample of what my Citrix Unity looks like on my machine. So when I call up my iPad, I can see this. There are individual apps there that I can run, and when I click on them, the app opens, not a whole environment. Just the app opens. So if it's something that's you know, unique and it doesn't have an iOS version, I can get to it. This is important because I have things like Lotus Notes that I still have to access sometimes. Yes, I said Lotus Notes. Right? Um, or you know, some of our IBM mainframes that still exist inside some of the companies for some of our data access, you know, some of our databases, it's still theirs. I need a way to do that. So if it's too much for just the individual app, I can actually open up a full Windows environment. I can open up a Windows desktop and I can go, here, you can get access to it. Now, what we found that really interesting was because I have so many people that go to China, China's got this rule that says you're not allowed to have a VPN. They outlaw it. Does it mean it doesn't work? Depends. Depends on how lucky you are, you know, where you are, and whether they shut it down or not. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But Citrix or VMware does all the time because it doesn't rely on a VPN connection. So we were trying to figure out, because with OneDrive, it's like somebody forgot how to, didn't put the file they needed to travel with, and it's on a network share that they don't have access to because they don't have VPN. With this environment, they can actually go in, mount the network share, grab the file they need, put it in OneDrive, even put it on their local computer OneDrive folder, and it's there immediately once it gets through the download process. And it actually goes up and resyncs back to the cloud so they have it going forward. Right? This was a huge win. It was a mindset change for all my users because they were like, I need a VPN, I need a VPN. I'm like, yeah, I appreciate that, but you can't have one where you're going, not legally. 
I need to think about that. And I come with this up, came with this workaround, and it solved the problem. You know, and it took some, you know, once they got the process, they're like, oh, this is a lifesaver. Because, yeah, if you forgot something, I can now get access to it. They don't have to rely, like, uh, can somebody go put that in my OneDrive folder for me? Right? And because, you know, being a global company, having time zone issues and trying to get somebody who do something for me who's in five time zones away can be a real problem. All right? Here's what the VMware one looks like. This is I used it at my previous job when I was at MIT. This is what we used all the time. Right? And as a sysadmin at you know places like MIT or the Broad Institute, you know I lived in terminal. I was dealing with large mainframes or cluster systems. I really needed a terminal. And I got an iPad, and I'm like, yeah, this is great, but I, you know, I need to go access something. I need to SSH into something. Well, I found this. This is Terminus. If you've never seen this program, it's pretty amazing. They do have a free version that just gives you the basic SSH, Telnet, and Moss Shell. If you don't know what Moss Shell is, Moss Shell was designed for ultra mobile devices. So when you're SSH into thing, it doesn't like to have drop packets like you can get over a cellular network. Like I connected to something and it just changes in tenor. And I'm like, oh, I lost my connection. I can re-log in again. Marshall is kind of a little more stable for that. It actually says, you know what? I'll be a little more resilient. I'll pull more. I'll cache more if I have to, right? So you can see you can actually create groups. You can create connections to servers. You can put SSH keys in. You can do all these things to give you SSH access from this device. That was a huge win for me. All right, so we talked about you know the device. Now we've talked about you know we've got the apps. So I've compared the two. I can give somebody an ultra mobile device with a business app that works for them. It could do the work they need. It's appropriate. But how do I deal with the storage? Because What's, what's the storage capacity of this device? Well, this one here is 256 gigs. The max you could get is a half gig on this generation or one terabyte, or sorry, half gig, half 512 gig or half a terabyte or on the new generation pads, it's one terabyte. I will be honest with you, it scares the living daylights out of me to think that somebody can take one terabyte of corporate data with them in a device this small and leave it anywhere. If that doesn't frighten you, we need to have a long talk, right? Is it f scares the death out of me? Because people have bad habits and they get distracted. My own manager, right, left his iPad on a plane. He, he got all the way back to his office and realized, where's my iPad, right? Fortunately, the airline found it, and he, we got it back, bef and it was still secured, so we didn't have to worry about wiping it, right? But it was a major concern. So when dealing with, you know, thinking about storage, you really have to understand, and I'm gonna, this is a mantra I have, this is, you have to understand the new model, right? This is a new method of thinking, all right? Traditional laptops, you get a spinning hard drive or solid-state drive, and you have network connections, and you actually put the data on, and you sync it back and forth between the network share. With this device, you're not going to do that. It's going to be, you know, you really need to look at and say cloud storage versus traditional network storage. You know, if, if somebody says to me, oh, I need to get access to this network share, how do we do it from the pad? I'm going, yeah, go into Unity. That's the only way you're going to get access to it because there's no method of mounting that network share from this device. It's just not designed to do that, right? But it is designed to talk to cloud storage. So hence, we're moving to OneDrive for the corporate environment or Google Drive or we're going to talk about all the different storage options out there, right? How do you deal with that? We're going to go into that in a little bit of detail. What about application-specific storage? We're going to see some of the gutches that deal with that. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, Local on the device, what does that really mean? You know, what's, how do we have to deal with that? And you know, what about backups? Do we need to worry about backups for the local device or the local storage? All right, so let's go ahead and dive in. 
Uh, OneDrive, again, this is the choice that my corporation uses. Right? We're going to look at Google Drive. We're going to look at Box, Dropbox, Adobe Cloud, Apple Cloud, right? or iCloud. So, so with OneDrive, you know, I'm going to kind of give you a kind of an overview. OneDrive is works, what we do is we put it on all the devices. And for traditional laptops and desktops, it creates a folder. And it's everything that gets put in that folder is now synced up into the cloud. And there's some naming convention issues you've got to follow. You know, the big issue I found for Mac users is they love slashes. Right? This is my file on this date. So it's like, OK, this is 11 8 2018. OneDrive can't take that. Why? Because Windows a slash is a path statement. It says, you know, this is a folder, this is a subfolder, this is the subfolder of the subfolder. Right? You can't do that. So, that, you know, so there are some tools you, we provide the users to kind of break some habits that relate to naming files. But with the iPad, you know, when I, we put OneDrive on there, it doesn't actually sync the data down. When you connect to it, it actually gives you an image, a preview of what's up in the cloud. So when if I look at it and go, OK, here's my structure. I see what I've put up there. I see all my files. They don't live on this device currently. I can go get them. If I need to go and take this pad on a plane and I need to work on a file, I have to think ahead of time and say, download it to the local storage, unless I have the ability to get reach it from the plane. Right? So it takes a little training, it takes a little forethought. Right? Whereas if I was on a laptop, it's synced. So it lives there and in the cloud. Here it just shows me unless I tell it to offload it and put it on the local device. Right? We do have access to SharePoint. SharePoint has OneDrive access also. So if I'm dealing with a team unit and they have their own SharePoint site, I can see all the data that's up there also. Same issue. If I'm not having a Wi-Fi or network connection available to me, I got to offload those files, download them to the local drive if I need to work on them. So G Suite, you know, Google Drive. How many people are actually using Google Drive? Good, good. Um, how many here have actually worked with Team Drive? Okay, a couple. So Team Drive is, you know, it was something, you know, five years ago I was screaming at Google for. It was like, yeah, Google Drive is great, but it was just a giant bucket, right? I needed to be able to segment out storage to create like a network share for a department, and that's where Team Drive came in. And it's really good at it now. Uh, but a couple caveats you need to worry about is you have a data cap of uploading. Now, let's be fair and truthful. I'm not going to create 750 gigs worth of data on this drive, this device, and then try to upload it. It's not going to happen. But you need to be aware of that. Because if you've got people working in a mixed environment and they're going, you know, I need to upload this giant file, you know, 750 is the cap for the day. Once you hit that, you're dead. You're done. It just sits there and goes, nope. So you have to wait till the next 24 hour period before it starts uploading again. Right? You do have a max file size of, again, five terabytes. Yeah, I'm not putting a five terabyte file down on anything like this. It wouldn't even fit anyway. Right? But it's, it's important to understand the relationship. You do have a daily quota up limit. Right? You have to wait. So that's an important. So if you're dealing with creatives who are dealing with larger files, you know, it's very possible that they can hit their data quota quickly. Box. Right? So I remember when Box first came out, and it was like, wow, free storage. That was huge. Like I can get free storage, so but they do have max file sizes. So I made the, took the time to show you that you have, you know, for a free personal account, the max file size you can put up there is 250 megs in size. Now it doesn't mean you know you can have lots of 250 files up there, but that's the max file size, right? If you have a, stand, a starter account, it's a two gig limit. If it's a enterprise or business enterprise account, it's five gigs. So I went back and I looked because it's been a while since I've worked with Box. You know, Box, the model is, you know, if you get your friends to join Box, and they, you, you know, we know that you got them on it, they give you more additional free space. Well, it caps out at 16 gigs. Right? 
I know a lot of companies are like, I need to do this on the cheap. It's like, all right, everybody in the department joined Box. We get, you know, I get one. It's like I'm getting all my storage, right? And it's just like, it's like a pyramid scheme. It's like, all right, we just kind of, at, at some point, somebody at the bottom is just getting screwed over, right? But it, it only goes up to 16 gigs, right? So if you're really serious about the need something big and enterprisey, you're going to go into either the starter or the business enterprise accounts, right? There are app integrations, and that was really where Box really started making its name, was they integrate with the different apps. So if you were using Outlook and you needed to, you know, the big problem today is trying to use the mail system to move data around. It gets hotter and harder because they're like, no, your attachments are too big, you're too large. Well, you know, Box said, oh, we'll just make a data link and you can download it. So we'll send a link to the file. And when the user gets it, they click on it and it just downloads it from your Box account, right? That was a huge thing, you know. I did include a comparison, so when you do get the slides, that link there is a comparison to show you the difference between Dropbox and Box, right? And there is a link there to show you if you're using Box, what your max file size is if you don't know. So I found that helpful. So Dropbox, right? Again, there's no limit to how big the files can be, right, for uploading, as long as you're using their tools. If you're just using the website to drop it up, it's a 50 gig max, right? You do have, if you write API, so if you're actually working and creating a workflow and you created a Dropbox API, it has a 350 gig cap. So that's important. So if you did something for a creative, like video files, you know, it may not be the best way to do that because I can see it getting past 350 real easy. Again, there's the app integration tools. If I took you to that link, you would see the, you know, 40, 50 different integration apps that they've already integrated into. That's pretty amazing. They have a pretty decent API that allows you to work on that yourself. And again, there's the link for the comparison. Let's move on to Adobe. All right. So, when, you know, when we sat down and said, all right, we have OneDrive as our cloud solution, and then we get Creative Cloud. And it's, it gives everybody cloud storage. And I'm like, oh, now we're really confusing the issue. We want everybody to put our files in our OneDrive. And then Adobe says, no, you can put them in ours. And it's like, no. Right? But the problem is it actually is very helpful because it stores all the Adobe settings. So if somebody configures Photoshop and Illustrator to work a specific way when they're licensed, you know, when they license it and use their cloud, it actually stores those settings. So if they go into another user's machine, log in with their username and password, get their license active, all their settings come down. Any of the reference files they put up there are there. Uh, I did check. You can, it doesn't sync, right? You can put, you know, other than Adobe files in that cloud because it creates a folder. Same issue on the iPad. It's not an active sync, it's a view, right? So the difference being, though, is if you create something on the pad and it doesn't have access to it right away, it's going to try and sync it later. It will try, all right? There is a web, a web access link there, so if you want to know what's in your Adobe Cloud, all right, you can go to that and it'll open up a web page and it'll show you all the data that's in your cloud. Can't do anything with the iPad without talking about iCloud. Yeah, so love and hate. I love Apple products, love, you know, the integrations they give me. I hate that they kind of ignore the enterprise, right? They kind of dabble in it. They still do. And I, you know, I've been around long enough with Apple where, you know, I've been in a briefings with them and they were like, yeah, we're focusing on enterprise. Year one, year two, year three. Where did it happen? Uh, we moved on. Yeah, you're not focusing on enterprise, you know. And focusing on enterprise means you're in it for the long haul, right? So, you know, this is part of the problem we had when, you know, they come out with XSERVs and they went, hey, great, we're focused on the enterprise. Yeah. If you have any history with Apple, you know, they've greater introducing version one of products. Getting to version two is a real pain because nobody wants the project. It was, it's now maintenance, right? It's not the big wow factor anymore. 
So iCloud, right? What we ran into a lot of times is users, when they wrote an app for the iPad, for iOS, they actually built it in to talk and store the file as an option into iCloud. Great for the consumer, horrible for business. We don't want people using it. We want people using our storage, our, you know, our cloud storage, not theirs, right? Um, but it does have some app integrations. And that's some of the stuff that we found interesting was like, you know, I'd look and say, you know, I get a drawing program and it, like, it can talk to two things. It can talk to itself and it can talk to iCloud, but not OneDrive, not to Google Drive, Box, Dropbox, right? And I'll talk a little about that in a little bit, right? Now, let's talk about security. You know, we need to protect these devices. So we're going to look again, how do you deal with data in the cloud and, the, you know, and dealing with the Files app? How many here are familiar with the Files app? Right? Introduced in iOS 11, Files app is actually Apple's way of trying to show you the structure on the pad itself. Right? If you've never looked at the iPad before, um, it's kind of a, a big bucket. Right? So everything goes in a big bucket, and it's meta tags, it's you know, things that show structure are things that are actually you don't see. It's not like a hard drive where I would go and say, all right, here's a folder, here's a file. Here's a folder, 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 file, right? In this, we're talking about tag, 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 here's the file, right? But when I look at it in raw, it's just all in the same container. It's all there, right? Files actually tries to honor that and says, all right, you want to see some structure. I want to show you how things are. And files is where everything is going. So uh, cloud storage companies really need to get on the, the bandwagon and say, all right, provide the integration into the files app. Then all the business applications need to say, you know what, if you want to save a file, tie it to the files app, because then I don't care. You can pick your own storage where it goes. Instead of saying, oh, I built my integration for Dropbox, or I built my integration for iCloud. We'll talk a little bit about Face ID and Touch ID and, and the MDM. So one of the big things we have to worry about in our world is making sure that this device has got every protection possible with it because it's so easy to leave behind or leave anywhere. You know, how many people here have actually you know, put something down, walked away and realized, I left my phone behind, I left my computer behind? Right, I need to go back and get it. Or I'll be right back, and it's like you leave it behind. Right? Well, in our world, when we're dealing with you know, intellectual property, that's a no-no. We harp on that all the time. So we try to push people to understand that you need as many protections as possible. And if you're not using two-factor protection for anything you do, you really need to start rethinking that and turning it on. It's a pain at times, but it really says... I'm using this device and it, it really is me, right? Uh, because it's funny, you know, my wife will, you know, she'll see I'll have to log into something and for my personal and she's on that also just as a, because it's my system really. And she goes, what is this that says you're trying to log into something? And it's like, yeah, it's just trying to verify that it's really me trying to do it. And it's just popping up on all my devices to remind me. It's like, are you doing that, right? Having encryption. How do we turn encryption on for these devices? Come on, that's an easy one. Passcode, right? It's the simple thing. You put a passcode on it, it encrypts the device, right? Um, that's really important, right? Understanding the clients you're dealing with, do they need HIPAA or, or, or Sarbanes Oxley, or we affectionately call SOX, compliance, right? That doesn't mean much to some people, to others it's critical. So if I have a medical facility that's using these devices for handling patient data, right, the cloud storage, is it compliant with HIPAA regulations? Can it survive an audit? Can it prove that it can survive an audit? Is it documented, right? Because I remember you know, when we first got Dropbox and it was like, and Google Drive, it was like, yeah, we were working with patient data and we went, failed the audit. I was like, ooh, it, that's really bad. Right? We had to rethink things when it was, you know, 
So it's really important to make sure you understand all of that, right? And how do we protect the data from being copied over to non-corporate users, right? I have a drawing that's for a shoe or a piece of apparel that's for fiscal year 2020, all right? Spring 2020. This is a new design. It's going to be hot, right? My competitors all want to know what I'm doing. How do I prevent them from gaining access and getting a version of that file before we actually went to manufacture, right? It may not sound like a major problem. It is. We have to protect our intellectual property all the time, right? So we need to really understand how sensitive the data is and what we're going to do with it. So we deal with it with a system called Intune. This is from Microsoft, right? No, I'm not a shrill for Microsoft. I just acknowledge when it's good, okay? Intune is a program that's still growing in maturity. It's been around for a while, um, but we found it really helpful in actually creating a, the ability to say who has access to a file. They can download it. They can work with it. They can put it back up. If they go to email it, it's like, uh-uh. You can't email it. It's not protected. They can send the link to the file, so if the other end of the person's authorized to get access to it, they can, but they can't physically pick it up. And why is that a big deal? Because I know for a fact that these devices go home with people. It's like, honey, I need you to just leave me alone for a little while. Here, go play on my iPad. Daddy, what's this? Mommy, what's this? Oh, I just got emailed. Right? Intune prevents that. And it actually helps us track those kind of interactions. And we can see those things. Now, I will tell you that it's really designed for Microsoft applications. They do create an SDK, so if you have an app that you want to really tie into Intune, you can actually, it has to have these tools put into it. So like Adobe Acrobat has an SDK for Intune. It actually works. It locks it down even more, right? So we have to, you know, but we have to play a balancing act with Intune. But what's interesting about Intune is if you've not talked to Jamf, their MDM, they're working with them to work with Intune to do that also. So it's, it's something to think about if you're in a bigger environment and you need to protect your intellectual property, something you really want to think about. So, you know, I can pick up this device and make sure that I am in compliance I am actually also protected from accidental sharing of data. All right. Now, face ID or touch ID and passcodes. So we have a 90-day password policy. I work, I, you know, I have these interesting conversations with the security team. And I go, I understand you want us to change our passwords every 90 days. I get it, right? But they're also requiring us to change our passcodes every 90 days but they're not in sync, all right? So most people's passcodes are numbers, but you can put alphanumerics in. You can change it to be the same as your network password. And there's actually something I encourage my users to do and say, when you change your network password, go back to your iPad device or your iOS device and change it to match. Change your passcode to match. Why? because they know they have to keep that secure. They type that in all the time. Sometimes what happens is the device, they rely on touch ID or face ID too much, and they forgot their passcode. And they go, I can't get into my device. Okay. And they keep trying. Locked out one minute. Keep trying. Locked out five minutes. Keep trying. Keep trying. Keep, oh, I wiped my device. Now, why is that bad? Well, because the truth be said, we discovered the hard way that programs like Sketchbook store its drawings inside itself. They have a gallery, and it's like you save a, you save a drawing, and it's like, okay, it's in inside itself. We discovered accidentally, because the, we managed these with AirWatch, that AirWatch team went through, was cleaning up some things, and they deleted a bunch of apps on us. So it went out and hit the whole fleet. Said, yep, you don't need this anymore. Took it off the machine. Realized really quickly, oops, that was a mistake. 
put it back. Damage was already done. We lost tons of data related to, you know, two seasons out, the, the work they were doing. They were preliminary sketches. They were freaking out. And we're like, we were trying to figure out, you know, what happened, why. And this is where I had to sit down and say, okay, I actually had to sit down with every app and said, how do I make it connect to cloud storage? That was a fun couple weeks. All right, sketchbook, what can you talk to? How do you talk to it? And what are the downsides if I shared the file back out that way? And we had to learn, you know, hey, there's ways of doing it. You know, make sure, yeah, I can save my file to OneDrive, but did it flatten the file on me? All right, or how do I make sure I save it as a native file? And is it, now I have it there and here, but they're not in sync. So this is just a backup, right? Um, how critical is the MDM on these devices? It's really critical. Being able to, you know, we've tried to train the users. When you run into a small problem, tell us early on. Like, you don't remember your passcode. Don't keep banging away at it till you wipe the device. If it's already, you know, if, if you've done it once and it's like you don't remember the passcode and you really don't remember it, tell me. It's still connected to the Wi-Fi. I can send a clear passcode command so you can just go in, unlock it. The first thing it's going to say to you is you need to put a new passcode in, right? But you go back into your device. If you wait too long, yeah, I have to, if the device gets wiped or I can't do anything with it. And currently that brings up our last point about dealing with MDMs is you really want to make sure your MDM is as user friendly as possible. If for people who live in the field. You don't want to have to say, yeah, you know what? You have to send me back your iPad. I have to rebuild it. That's not a real good solution. So that's where we bring up to talking about support, right? How do we deal with remote assistance? How do we deal with apps? How do we look at passcode locks? We just l talked a little bit about device wipe. Can the user rebuild it? So looking at it and say, you know, what are our options for remote support? Well, if you've never, you know, Baumgart, I assume a lot of you are familiar with Baumgar or Log Me In, right? These actually are, have the ability to put a client on the pad and you can actually see what the user is going through. And if you've not done that, it's really interesting because one of the hardest things we do when we do support, I'm on the phone talking to a user, I have to trust their eyes and their verbal communication skills to tell me what they're looking at. That's an interesting skill. Right? Back in the 80s when I was doing phone support for a manufacturer, I was like, I used to have to create, it's like, all right, I'd put diagrams in front of me of what they're looking at, and it's like, and I would give them reference points. It's like, do you see this? No, you're not there yet. Do you see this? Right? Same thing. You're on your iPad. I can't do something. Are we on the same screen visually? Right? Being able to actually go in and say, you know what? say I can see your screen. I can't control your screen. I can see your screen. I can have a conversation. I can chat with you. I can talk to you on the phone. But to be able to say, no, you, that's not it. No, it's not it. Log me in has a really neat feature. You can annotate the screen for the user. So you can't hit a button for them, but you can draw a circle around and say, see that? Touch that. Great, now we can move forward, right? That's a huge win, right? And that's a new feature, right? Uh, Apple, yeah, you can do, you know, if the user has a laptop, you can put the USB cable in, you can get QuickTime player running, and you can actually do a screen recording. So if you have access to the laptop, you can actually see their iPod screen, our iPad screen at the same time, because you're seeing it on the QuickTime player, right? But Let's talk about apps. Here's the real requirement, right? So the app stores, right? We want to make sure that all apps that are on a corporate device are from properly licensed. And we look at it and say, all right, so we have our own app store that we provide to them. Saying if you need an app, right, we don't want you purchasing it from the Apple iTunes store. We want you to make sure it's coming from our app store. So we tell people, here's everything they have access to, right? Again, we talk.
gets wiped on them automatically, that it's easy for them to rebuild it. And like an Airwatch, it says it has to have a master account. They, they need to log in with their credentials or a master account that we use, right? You know, I have this argument with the security team going, it only does one thing. It can't do anything with it. All it does is it says, I can build the machine over again. I don't care if they built it 100 times a day, as long as they're, it's still controlled by us. Right? I am including some reference links for you, so you will see you know, uh, two products that I'm very familiar with, Jam Pro and AirWatch. If you've not used an MDN, I recommend these highly. It doesn't mean it's the only and best solutions. There are some others here. I just was not familiar with them, so I don't want to, you know, I can't tell you anything about them, right? And there are two reference links there for Baumgart and LogMeIn. Really check out LogMeIn if you haven't. It's got some neat, neat features, right? This is me. That's my work email address. Uh, if you use that link to talk to me, it will actually put, it'll tag the email with Mac Tech so I know where, how my relationship with you is, right? I do respond. It just may be a day or two before I get to you, right? I do have clients from across the globe that I have to take care of first, right? But I, you know, I will get back to you. I will have a conversation with you. I'm more than happy to do anything you need and help you. I'm a full believer in, you know, shared resources. I have experience that you may not have. Tap into it, right? Because I'm going to find out what you offer, and I want to be able to tap into yours. I know I'm going to be using that as, like, probably within an hour. I'm going to probably pull you aside and ask you some questions, for sure. Um, well, Leon Lincoln, I, I, do, I do charge by the hour, for sure. <laughs> for me. <laughs> for sure. So everybody, please give Leon a, a bit of appreciation here. Thank you.